Hello, Kingdom men. Ned Winters here again for our session number 15. Keep sending me your questions and comments, and I hope everybody had a challenging week. Remember, men, there's no maintaining. We've got to strive each and every day to get better. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the certainty of your kingdom. Help me to show my gratitude to you by serving you faithfully each and every day. Give me the grace I need to make the most of the time, talents, and treasures you have loaned to me. Help me to use them to prioritize your agenda over mine. Help me live out 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. Make me steadfast, immovable, always abounding in your work, O Lord, knowing that my toil is not in vain in you, O Lord. Transform me into a kingdom man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, man. Last week, we discussed chapter number 14, a kingdom man and his family life. Never underestimate your role as a husband and as a father. Remember, dads, fathers, that your children's view of God will largely be dependent on their view of you. Today, we've got chapter number 14, a kingdom man and his church life. Psalms 128 moves from the individual man fearing the Lord to the result showing up in his family's life. When a man is in, the, in alignment under God, the results of his relationship with God spread out to those around him. Today, we'll look at the results of a man's relationship with God in connection to the church. Psalms 128 and 5. The Lord bless you from Zion. And may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Men, you are to receive a blessing, and that blessing is based on your connection with Zion, which, as you know, is the established New Testament church. To the degree that you are connected to Zion is the degree to which you will be blessed or not blessed. This is true, not just for you, but those under your care and within your influence. It's not all about you, men. Men, there is a huge problem we face in our churches today. The problem isn't, isn't that we're not sincere. The problem is that we've misunderstood the kingdom. The church is focusing on the wrong assignment. By misunderstanding God's kingdom, we have not taken full advantage of the church's authority and influence. Authority and influence both within its walls and outside of them. From a kingdom perspective, the church has been given a biblical mandate, a mandate to be relevant to spiritual and social needs, not just in the church, but also in our society. When the church fails to function under this kingdom perspective, the church stops being the biblical church it was designed to be. Man, the church does not exist just for programs and projects and preaching and building projects. The church exists to equip believers to show God's glory. The church exists to have an impact within our culture. The church exists to restore lives and advance the kingdom of God. The primary purpose of the church is to reveal the ethical, political, social, and economic aspects of God's rule in our society. The church is to oper operate in the world, and the church is to offer an alternative to the world. By doing this, the church is set apart as a heaven much like an embassy here on earth. As you know, an embassy is a, is a sovereign territory on foreign soil. At an embassy, the rules and laws of the nation the embassy represents applies. Embassies never belong to the countries they are in. Embassies belong to the country where they are from. If you were to visit another country as an American citizen and went to the American em embassy, all American laws and procedures would apply at that embassy, regardless of what country you were in. The American embassy is a little bit of America a long way from home. Now, the church is supposed to be a little bit of heaven a long way from home. It is to be a place where the values of eternity 
eternity are to apply. It is to be a place where the victories in heaven bear fruit here on earth. It is also to be a place where God directs his blessings. Take a look at Psalms 133 and 3. And as a result, societies begin to transform and become productive. Because of this and more, the church ought to be, it has to be, it needs to be an essential part of a kingdom man's life. Let's take a step back and take a look at Zion. What is Zion? There are multiple scriptural references of this place called Zion. There's a mountain called Zion. This serves as a holy place where God's presence was found. There's also a city called Zion. This was, this was a city of David or Jerusalem where God dwelled. And the temple in the Old Testament culture was referred to as Zion. This was a gathering place. This was a place where a father would take his family to worship Yahweh and a place to offer sacrifices. Everything centered on this temple called Zion. Zion was now a permanent location. If you remember, it had been a temporary dwelling, the tabernacle. When the Israelites went to Zion, they were reminded that they were part of a covenant. They were a people who thought alike, acted alike, and they viewed life the same. This was a co covenantal community. Everyone shared the same value system because everyone lived under the same king and everyone belonged to the same kingdom. In Psalms 128 and 1, we see how God blesses you if you feared him. Now, in Psalms 128 and 5, we read that God will also bless you from Zion. So it's safe to conclude that Zion is a place where God's presence dwells and a place where believers gather to worship God. Men, it was unimaginable that a Jewish mother would ever have to wake up a Jewish father and ask him if he was going to Zion today. Man, how often on a Sunday morning are you the first one up? Excited, waking up the family, getting ready for church. Get excited, man. As a believer, God is going to do certain things simply because of your relationship with him. But he will also do certain things because of your connection to Zion. These things come out of your connection with others in the midst of God's presence. Now, don't misunderstand me. As an individual, you can and will experience God's power. As an individual, you can and will experience God's blessings, but up to a certain level. There will be aspects of God's power and blessings that you may never experience as a single individual. These aspects only come when you are connected to his people. It's similar to a family. There are some things that each family member will experience on his or her own. But other, th but other things, like a family vacation, only occur as a result of being a part of the group. You can't go to Disney World on a family vacation all by yourself. The memories, the interactions, the activities just won't be quite the same. In the Old Testament, men took their families and those under their care to Zion because he knew Zion was where each would receive favor and direction from God. It was where the principles and promises of the covenant became real. Zion was where he connected his family to something bigger than themselves, connected to a community of people, people who thought and functioned under God's kingdom covenant. As men, we have missed out in multiple ways. We have missed out in the church, both experiencing and displaying God's power and blessings collectively. With so much uh, emphasis on individualism and self, it, it is easy to forget God's collective program. We miss out on the benefits of being connected and we forget there are consequences for not being connected. Men, it's not the same when we just show up to check church off our list. Hey, I'm guilty. Remember, we were taught the Lord's Prayer. 
You're not an only child. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father who is in heaven, not my Father who is in heaven. When you are part of something larger than yourself, you get more out of your experience with God. His blessings become more real in your life when you connect with his people for his purposes and you get so much more than you do if you're on your own. That is why the writer of Hebrews made the point that we, as a body, should continually seek to assemble. Hebrews 10 and 25 reads, Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We have been instructed to assemble together not simply just for getting together. It is so much greater. It has a much greater purpose. It is in connection with the day drawing near. It is connection with how we as a church are to operate in God's kingdom. In Hebrews, we also read about the character of Zion as the established church whose head is Jesus Christ. Let's read it. Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sounds of words which sound which was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Just as the Old Testament Israelites were part of a covenant, we are part of a new covenant. Ephesians tells us that when the church gathers, we are to come together as one without any barriers between us because of our foundation in Christ. Let's read it. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then, You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing up into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being put together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Men, as you might have guessed, just as Satan seeks to break up the family, he's trying to destroy our future, and he's trying to break up the community of believers. Satan knows that a divided, weak church will never experience all of the power and blessings of God. Look around. Our nation is in shambles, and The greatest distraction to solving the problems facing our nation today is the division of the body of Christ. Our nation is crying out for an impactful church. When it comes to the cultural presence, influence, and community impact, we have failed to make any noticeable difference in our society. Why? Because the church remains divided and secluded. It's heartbreaking to see the fractures and isolation that exist between us as a nation, but more so as the body of Christ. God is God of unity. Where there is disunity and division, God's spirit is not free to dwell. Our corporate experience with God in making a difference in our society is hushed and limited. It is limited to the same degree that our fellowship with one another is hushed 
and limited. Church is not merely designed as a place to go once a week and feel good about a sermon or about a song, but it is designed to serve as a functioning community where the gifts, the talents, skills of all members are joined together into a greater and more productive whole. And men, you have a major responsibility in making that a reality. Men, we have to refocus on church. We're like teenagers living in a home. We want our own room with our own television, our own iPad. We want our own phone. We want our own door so we can sh shut it whenever we feel like it. But later, we want to come out and ask, what's for dinner? Men, we want the convenience when it comes to living with others, but we don't want to be disturbed with anything else. Many men have come to view the church for its conveniences. Help me, bless me, serve me, preach to me, sing to me, oh, pray for me. But don't expect me to be a vehicle to minister, minister to anyone else. And you better not ask me to help you impact this world. Come on, man. We have to be better than that because our churches have often been focused on buildings and creating programs more so than about advancing the kingdom and personal lives, families, communities in our nation. Many men have come to view the church as a task to be done rather than a community to be in. In most lives, albeit ex some exceptions do exist, women are built to respond to relationships, while men are built to respond to ruling. Women are wired to respond to cuddling, while men are wired to respond to conquering. We're made differently, so we respond differently. Yet, what happens in the church is that the church is, uh, they offer nice, warm fuzzies, to cuddle emotions while withholding or ignoring any potential challenge that men can conquer. Often the temperature of the church is set for women and therefore men sit a little cold, a little chilly. So many men come to church only because they are pushed to do so or because they feel guilty for not doing so. Many men stand there as the music play with the feeling that something just doesn't fit, something just doesn't seem right. Something just doesn't seem manly about church for many men. Church is cute with its direct de decorations, soft music, long songs. It has an atmosphere often geared toward evoking emotion. This may be why a lot of men simply do their time, albeit sincerely, but they, re but they don't view church as a way where they can change and impact the world. Man, this wasn't the church Jesus established. When Jesus talked about his body, he spoke of a force that even the gates of hell could not prevail against. See Matthew 16 and 18. Ecclesia, or church in the New Testament Greek society, referred to a governing council who legislated on behalf of the population. It didn't refer to a place where you went simply to get inspired. Rather, it was where men came together to fully legislate duties. Somewhere between the cross and our culture, the concept of ecclesia, the church, has gotten watered down. Watered down from the full potency of its original meaning. To be a part of the ecclesia was to participate in the governing body whose job was to bring heaven's point of view into hell's society. The church is intended to be a group of people, listen to this, who have been called to bring the governance of God into the relevant application and practice of humankind. When Jesus spoke of the church withstanding the forces of the gates of hell, he chose the term gates because at the time, Gate referred to a place where legislative activities took place. The gate was where the leaders of the town would meet, meet to enact business and make decisions on behalf of the community. 
The concept of legislation for the body of Christ is reinforced by the fact that Christ gives keys to the church. So those who have been given the keys can use them to gain access to heaven's authority and execute here, execute it here on earth. Take a look at Matthew 16 and 19. While Jesus is positioned at the right hand of God to govern from heaven, we are positioned with him. Take a look at Ephesians 2 and 6, which reminds us that God will often choose what he is going to do based on the church. Ephesians 3 and 10. The purpose of the church reaches beyond a mere meeting place. It reaches beyond a meeting place for spiritual inspiration or a condemning view of the culture. The purpose of the church, the ecclesia, is to manifest the values of heaven within the conflicts of humankind. And men, you have a major responsibility in making that a reality. Today, many of our churches have strayed from their purpose, their purpose as heaven's embassy here on earth. It has come to look like a social club. As a result, we're facing a cultural tsunami. And this tsunami is sweeping away a generation of men and boys from becoming the kingdom men God intended them to be. The church, like an assembly line, has been designed to produce something. It has been designed to produce kingdom men. Kingdom men who are visible, verbal, and unapologetic disciples of Jesus Christ. When an assembly line does not produce what it's supposed to produce, it is easy to, to conclude that there is a flaw in the factory and is a design issue must be addressed. When you look at the weakness, weaknesses of Christian men today, you can conclude that there is a flaw, a flaw in the factory that has been established to produce kingdom men. The goal of the church to live out God's kingdom agenda. Each church should make it a priority to have a men's ministry, a men's ministry that seeks to instruct, inspire, encourage, equip, and hold accountable its men in becoming kingdom men. This is called discipleship. Each church should have a major focus on discipleship. Discipleship is a developmental process of the local church that brings Christians from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity so they are then able to repeat the process with someone else. Discipleship enables men to overcome ungodly influences, overcome ungodly definitions of man manhood that they have been accustomed to or influenced by. When a man faces obstacles and challenges living as a kingdom man, the support system God has placed here on earth is the local church. As men, we must take full advantage of this support system. Far too often there are too many, far too many men take, not taking advantage of this support system. But more important than taking advantage of this support system, we must be actively involved in the discipleship process so that we can develop and strengthen that support system. Life is not meant to be lived as a lone ranger. Okay, raise your hand if you were head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and on your first offensive series, you would send Tom Brady in alone to face off against the 11 defensive players. Go ahead, Tom. Let's see what you got. Let's see what, what you're really made of. Let's see what all this hype was up in New England. I'm guilty. No, no, no. I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Tom, if you're watching, I'm just kidding. I would never do that to you. But, man, you know exactly what that feels like. Unfortunately, we've been operating way too long as lone rangers. It's gotten to the point where it feels natural. But that's not how it's supposed to be. Oneness in the body of Christ is a requirement 
to advance the kingdom. It is the character of the body as the Apostle Paul described. When we are a body with multiple parts that performs multiple functions, unless you are intentionally connected to and operating in that mindset of a, of, of a body, men, you will fail to maximize your purpose and potential. And we will fail to maximize our purpose and our potential as a church, as a body. One of the church's primary roles is to create an environment, an environment for men that fosters, fosters authentic discipleship. And one of our primary responsibilities, men, is to be a part of a church body that offers discipleship opportunity, that offers sound teachings, small groups to connect with, and that offers ways for us, for you and I, to serve. Don't miss that. It's a give and take relationship. A man's involvement with the church is critical. But it seems like so many men are not taking an active role, not in the church, in any men's ministry, or even in promoting God's kingdom agenda. What's missing from the church? What's missing from the ecclesia? The men, kingdom-minded men. Why? Why are they missing? We have failed to embrace one of the main reasons. Failed to embrace the fact that the church is, produ is to produce spiritually strong men. The church must be where a man not only receives instruction for personal growth, but also where he is to take that instruction and teachings and rehearse and share it with his family during the week. The church is to be a place to grow boys into men through spiritual parenting. Similar to what Paul wrote to his own children and beloved son in his letters to Timothy and to Titus. In these letters, Paul is writing to men who are becoming pastors. Paul told them about preaching, he told them about teaching. He told them about serving. Paul also talked to them about spiritual mentoring. In the same way parents should raise their children into responsible, uh, responsible adults, the church is to provide an environment to grow God's children up as well to be spiritually mature and responsible. And men, it is our responsibility to be connected in this process. When Paul wrote to his son in the ministry, Timothy, Timothy was a reasonably young pastor in his mid-30s, maybe early, or early 40s. Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy to advise his disciple on how he should pastor how he should pastor a young flock in the midst of a volatile culture. Paul wrote, 1 Timothy, Timothy 3, 14 through 15, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Paul made sure Timothy, Timothy didn't go to the marketplace to get his, get his instruction on how to run the church. He didn't con conduct an opinion poll or borrow from the culture. Paul made it clear that the church was supposed to function as the pillar of support and of truth. This is because the job of the church is to hold up the standard of truth. It is not to satisfy the culture or even make everyone feel good. It is to offer God's truth in a world without it. Men, we need spiritual fathers like the Apostle Paul. Without spiritual fathers like Paul, we continue to turn out men labeled as nice and helpful rather than strong and responsible. Even though Timothy and Titus were not Paul's biological children, he spoke to them and related to them as a father would a son. In turn, Timothy was 
Timothy was to call the men to lead in public prayer as well as to equip and identify men under him to serve in leadership in the church. Timothy had a father in Paul and was to be a father to those under him. Man, it's bad enough if a young man doesn't have a biological father to mentor him and help him grow. But when there's no spiritual father as well, he's fatherless twice. When a boy or a man is fatherless twice, he is in, in jeopardy of doubly missing out on receiving the blessing that he needs in his life. All throughout biblical history, a boy looked forward to receiving the blessing. The blessing was when a father would put his hands on his son and transfer the benefits of the father, father's life to the next generation. A blessing was always meant speaking the future into someone. Unfortunately, what's prevalent in our church today is that we have a generation of unblessed men. We have a generation of men who are not able or unwilling to pass on the blessing simply because they have not been taught the pillar of truth. They have not been taught God's word in such a way that they have learned to make it real in their own lives. A sermon on Sunday isn't enough to make disciples no matter how great the preacher is. And men, it is our responsibility to be connected in this process. The word of God is not simply meant to be known, but it is also meant to be applied. When Jesus mentored his disciple, he did it in such a way that he imparted the truth in action. Discipleship always included information, but discipleship is not complete until it also includes action. Every man is to have a spiritual father who guides his life in the ways of God. And every man is to be a spiritual father to someone whom they influence as well. You should have both a spiritual father and be a spiritual father. Without this connection, church is simply something to do. It's not life-changing or impactful to others. Along with spiritual fathers, a man also needs brothers. A real brother walks with you when the world walks on you. The one thing that Jesus did with the men that he led was he placed them in challenging situations. He didn't just spend all day teaching the Bible or leading them in worship songs. Rather, he allowed them to be in challenging situations where their faith was tested and they were required to man up. He put them in places where to move forward, they had to move. They had to take a step of faith. Jesus was the excellent mentor. A spiritual mentor disciples those with, within his influence in such a way that advancing God's kingdom becomes a reality. Sometimes that is done in the context of teaching, but oft, oftentimes is done through action. A kingdom man is to live in such a way that the next generation says, I want that. I want what you have. He is, to, he is to model kingdom living in his actions and in his relationship with others. Mentoring is not something formal or something you do once a week for an hour. Mentoring is a way of life. However, we are missing so many of these men, mentors in the kingdom of God to show younger men how they are to be. And we are also dealing with a lot of young ladies, ladies who have been raised without a kingdom man in their life. And unfortunately, so many women don't even know what to look for in a man to marry. A man's intentional involvement in his local church must be a priority both to give to others and to learn from others. The assignment of the church is to instruct and model, to show men how to reclaim their divine 
divinely ordained roles, not just in society, but also in the church. The biblical church exists to advance God's kingdom, not just to defend it. Unless we, the church, purposely set out to become kingdom-minded, we are not being the church. We have become just another social club, a social club based on certain moral codes of conduct and a belief system. Men, no club or social group ever change the face of society. If we are going to impact our communities and our nation for Christ, men, we are going to need to be the church that Christ established. We need to start teaching about advancing the kingdom and not just about how to do church. And men, it is our responsibility to be connected in this process. Men, get involved. Get connected. Serve. Lead. Pray. Teach. Train. Discover how God has gifted you. Discover how those gifts can benefit the church. Are you great at fixing cars? Then consider starting a workshop where you train disadvantaged youth and help them acquire skills to get a job and get off the streets. Do you have a background in law? Start or participate in a ministry within the church where you moderate disputes according to biblical principles of reconciliation. Do you know the ins and outs of computers? Reach out to others in the, in the church or in the community who can benefit from that. Are you a successful businessman? Mentor young adults in your church or in the community. Let them shadow you and spend time with you while you're at work. The possibilities are endless and the outcomes are priceless. In fact, men, doing this is how most battles are won. It is how the Israelites defeated the Amalekites. Exodus 17, 11 through 12. So it came about when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Both Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until sunset. Moses held up his hands during the battle. This was to evoke heaven's assistance in, in earth's conflict. Because the battle waged on, Moses' arms grew tired. He wanted to quit. He wanted to give up. Yet, because Moses had other men who were able to come alongside him when he was worn out, together they made sure that heaven came down on behalf of earth. And since they did that, Joshua beat the Amalekites in the battle. What determined the outcome in the valley were the men on the mountaintop. Just like football, a game is never won or lost by one man. The victory over the Amalekites came as a result of men coming together, playing their part, and being stronger as a whole than they ever could have been on their own. Men, it's time for Earth's battles to be won and God's kingdom to be advanced. It's time for men to link up with other men and call heaven down to earth. When this happens, the church will have a visible impact, not only in the lives of the members and their family, but also in their community, our nation, and our world. Many men, Christians today, are spiritual orphans. Many men, children of God, have no family relationship. Others are like foster children, bouncing from house to house to house, never truly finding a home. Yet, we all know that children develop best in families. They develop when they are connected. If you are a disconnected Christian man, you are living outside of God's blessing. When a man either neglects or abandons his local church, he limits the favor or blessings that God wants to bring to him, as well as through him to his family. As a result, it will take him much longer to reach his destiny, and it will delay his family into getting to theirs as well. Everyone's familiar with HOV lane, right? High occupancy vehicle lane. 
The HOV lane is dedicated for those traveling with more than one passenger. If you are traveling alone in an HOV lane, a police officer has a right to pull you over and give you a ticket. This lane is to be used only with vehicles with more than one passenger. It is not meant for someone traveling alone. If you're traveling alone, you should get in a regular lane in the mess, in the masses with everyone else. But if you're traveling with someone, you can get in the HOV lane and bypass all the, all the masses, all the messes, and get to where you're going a lot faster than the regular traffic. Men, God has a special lane. It is for those who intentionally connect with others in the body of Christ. It is a lane that allows you to go further and faster in his kingdom, further and faster than you ever can alone. This lane is called his ecclesia. This lane is called his church. And men, it is our responsibility to be connected to the church. Wow, what a great lesson. Next week, we'll cover chapter number 15, A Kingdom Man and His Community. This will be our last chapter in the book, and after that, we'll have a conclusion slash review. Men, I hope everyone's getting something out of these lessons where you can take and apply in, in your daily life. And hang in there, men. We are all most there. Keep sending me your questions and comments and have a productive week. Let's pray out. Lord, you are first in my time, my talents, and my treasures. Help me to make your kingdom agenda my agenda. Help me to make an eternal difference for you, O oh Lord, by being the kingdom man you created me to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.